right, guess what? It's time for some real estate therapy. And um, today we're going to talk about um, the big M in real estate, which is money. But in this case today, it's yep. also M mm -hmm. is for Manny. Manny. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> Manny. We'll go Apollonio. with it. <laughs> Um, who is a colleague and friend of mine. Um, and I'm going to, let's have you introduce yourself. Sure. Cynthia, thank you for having me on your show here. It's definitely an honor and I love the opportunity. So uh, I'm Manny Apollonio, certified financial planner. Um, I have been working at Hanke and Company Wealth Management for 14 years. Last year, I became wow. a partner. Woo! Finally. And, um, you know, I've been under the wing of my, my, the principal of my firm and, uh, you know, he's 30 years, my senior. And when he chooses to retire, I'll be taking over our book of clients of a hundred families here in the Bay area and actually outside of the Bay area. But, um, yeah, the type of work I do is helping families work through <laughs> the big M money issues and uh sometimes that involves purchasing or selling real estate sometimes it involves involves a psychological um understanding or approach and i think that's that's something different that we bring to the table is a willingness and openness to have maybe awkward mm -hmm. or difficult conversations but are super productive and ultimately help yeah. clients get to where they want to be. So that's well, like, me in a nutshell. I like you in a nutshell. And uh, I think that's this is something <laughs> that you and I have in common, which is a, a very um, kind of holistic approach or, I mean, that word gets used a lot. Um, we are aware of the undercurrents. We're, we're actually bringing to the surface, yes. at least for ourselves, the subtext, what's going on in any situation, you know, like the husband and wife or the husband and the husband yes. or the wife and the wife are standing there in the kitchen and there's some thing that just happened, some unfolding of, of, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about the color of the refrigerator or something. Well, it's not about that. It's not about the refrigerator at all. And, um, and you in your uh, in your work as an advisor in helping these families and these people uh, manage their money, um, you have to be cognizant of that. Or you don't have to be because there's plenty of people who, professionals who might think they can completely ignore that aspect. Um, but I mm -hmm. think it's kind of a superpower to be able to hold something deeper for people. Yes, absolutely. The word empath is coming into my mind right now. And I think it's super important when people are making these huge decisions to look at it from very, from, and from multi dimensions, right? Not just the bottom line, not just the tax consequence, not just the rate of return. Ultimately, does this person get closer to their personal definition of fulfillment by making this decision. Right. And we're there to witness. I'm not there to tell them what to do. I'm there to show them what's possible. And um, yeah, it's a very, um, it's a really interesting approach because I, I have a train, I have training in coaching. Mm -hmm. So like personal life coaching, I went to a Coactive Training Institute in San Rafael. They're one of the largest, most recognized coaching uh, training firms in the country. Um, but what, what I've learned and what was um, kind of retaught to me this week in my interaction with a client was that I am there to help a client with their agenda, not my agenda. 
Um, so, you know, I think my approach to financial planning is a little bit different in that I bring like a coaching, life coaching kind of uh, feel to it. You know, I can crunch the numbers for you. I can show you the pie graphs. I can show you rates of return. But ultimately, I, I want to know why is it important to you to get that 9% rate of return? What is that going to get you? And if right. it's, if it's, if your answer is, I want the peace of mind, or I want to, uh, I want to just make sure that my family's taken care of, I want to, those are the things I really want to know. Because we can optimize the plan in that way. And I think with a coaching approach versus like a consulting approach, consultants are supposed to have the answers. With a coaching approach, we're both looking at this, whatever it is you are bringing to the table, kind of both as observers or witnesses. And I just ask questions that evoke uh, the answer from you because you know your life better than I know your life. I have a pretty good idea, but ultimately you get to decide where you go. Right. And so that's where the coaching comes in. And I think when people are able to tie their everyday behavior to, uh, to an end goal, for example, if it's uh, forgoing current spending to instead save some of it for the future, mm -hmm. like that's a new positive behavior we're trying to reinforce. Maybe it's easier to do it when they have in their mind, um, I don't know, a, a, a vision or a, an image in their mind of like what it will feel like with their family when they have their first Christmas in their new home. Right. Like yeah. that's the level of imagery and and focus and intention i think drives people to better financial outcomes yeah it's uh um i think i i it in my in my work a lot of times there's this old saying about buyers or liars <clears throat> and what that it's very crass but what it really means <laughs> is a lot of times buyers don't know what they're looking for they they think mm -hmm. they know what they're looking for so they lie about it. And, you know, we believe them. I believe them because I'm serving them. And yet I've come to know that a lot of times people don't quite know what they want or why they want what they want. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know for my, myself, I don't often know what I want. I recently had um, a um, really gifted Rosen body worker um, who I see um, you know, I was, I was able to, with her, articulate this sort of feeling in my body when I thought about this, this vague goal off in the future. And mm -hmm. she was able to help me realize more detail about what that goal was. What was it? What was it that I was feeling? Because I couldn't articulate mm -hmm. it at all. And, you know, like I'll have people say, I just have to live in Coal Valley and, and um, you know, I want to know, it's important to understand why they want to be in Coal Valley. Yes, absolutely. So if it's because they want to be close to the park, Golden Gate Park, so that they can go running. Um, well, there are a lot of other neighborhoods that are adjacent to Golden Gate Park. And we can, you know, investigate that because Maybe Coal Valley isn't the end all be all for them. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's how I think of it from real estate standpoint. Yeah, and I and maybe in like my world, people who are saving for retirement, let's say, they just save and they save and they save and they don't actually know when they're supposed to get off of the hamster wheel because that's what they were taught. <laughs> You know, and so we have, you have to have that conversation with yourself is what do you actually need to feel that confidence to say, I think 
this is enough. I know my portfolio is going to replenish itself at this rate. I'm only spending at this rate. Once those answers are addressed, then I think people can start thinking about retirement. But um, yeah, a lot of the time, maybe we're, we're, we're just doing things we think we should be doing. That's so, I mean, that's crazy that you just said that because this is something on my mind. I'm getting up there in years and I need to start thinking about this and, and, uh, uh, and, and someone else I know who's really close to retiring and thinking about it. Um, they were saying, I don't know when enough is enough. And I'm in a lot of fear around this. And that's that's where a, um, because there is a leap of faith in saying, okay, it's time to enjoy my life in different ways and to reap the fruits of, of my labor. Yes. And yet, and uh, here's a question for you. Have you talked, have you met anyone? I mean, I'm sure that there are exceptions, but I don't think I've met anyone who retired and then said, oh man, what a bad idea that was. (laughs) No, but you bring up a good point. There is, and I've witnessed this over and over and over again with my pre-retiree clients, is that um, there's like a period of awkwardness (laughs) after they retire because you just don't know what you're meant to be doing. And I tell my clients in kind of a coachy way, embrace the awkward because it it is awkward. It's going to be until you... uh, until your new path is kind of shown to you, whatever that may be, right? People have ideas, but we say just embrace the awkwardness of it. (laughs) The money part is solved. You just got to figure out what you want to do with your time. So one one of my brother-in-laws retired about five years ago and he's still going to the, the office a lot. And um, I think the awkward phase has now moved into where it's just awkward for all of his former <laughs> colleagues who are like, what are you, do- what are you doing here? Right. Right. Why are you here? Right. And, I mean, that's a whole other thing, but, um, but. Oh yeah. So many good questions I could ask there. It's like, what's the feeling you get when you walk into the office? What's important to you about showing up every day? what's something that you might be avoiding? You know, all these like, oh, they're kind of like deep in there, Mm -hmm. but they might help illuminate like for that person. Why is this my habit? Some people just really love working, but but yeah, you're right. There's awkwardness. (laughs) There's like a, a habitual thing. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why that's happening. I get it. But uh, I think for me, this brings up the idea that um, now you've said that money is weird or you tell us about that Mm. money weirdness, but um, I think money is so fraught. It's people are in such, there's so much fear around money. Like, oh yeah, money, scary. I better not make any, (laughs) right? Right. I don't want wealth because that's just, that's frightening to me. I mean, there are people who think that way. Yes. Money, bad. Exactly. And I say that there's weirdness around money and there is because we're all coming to the conversation about money from all these different places. So think about your earliest memory of money. Think about how your parents talked about working. Think about what your grandma said about money. All of those messages, if you have not actively worked to disprove them, (laughs) continue in your mind. And we go around walking around with outdated stories, maybe. Maybe the outdated story for your friend that hasn't retired yet is, uh, you know, we grew up the way we did and we had enough to survive, but we never had enough to to really thrive, or I don't know, 
I just made right. that up. But yeah, that no. might be the messaging that tells him, nope, you got to keep working. You got to keep showing up. You got to, I don't know. But that's where I talk about, like, that's where the weirdness of around money comes from is mm -hmm. like the recognition that you might be walking around with an outdated money story. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I think, part of the work with the clients I work with is illuminating them and saying, you know what, actually, Cynthia, you're in a really great financial position, probably a lot better than you thought you were. Right. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, there's this uh, concept in uh, psychology or psychotherapy counseling of telling a new story. Like somebody walks around with the story being, um, I'm, uh, I'm unattractive. Nobody love, will love me. Mm -hmm. Um, so that might be a story or, um, um, I'm never successful at anything, but in fact, that person's been successful and they just need to reframe the story. What you're saying, I think part of your work is to help people befriend themselves as they look at their story and, yeah. and begin to, to gently shift that so they can be it can be different yes i just had a conversation with a client today and we're not the people that we're not so clients sometimes want the permission to spend the money right mm -hmm. and my client does not she's she's got plenty to meet her needs and we're always encouraging her to spend more money on herself and she told us about like an awful trip, airline trip. And we said, did you fly coach? <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. And she said, well, yeah, but of course I did. And we're like, okay, here's a challenge. <laughs> on, your next, on your next flight, we want you to upgrade mm. and let us know how that feels. You know? And so it's these, these like little steps into a new story and sometimes like a little bit of permission is what's required. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. It's. Yeah. I can imagine I'm, I'm having this, this uh, fantasy picture of her um, being shocked when they call for first class to board <laughs> and she realizes, Oh wait, that's me. And that's me. wait a minute, I don't belong here. And then, and yes. then she gets in the cushy seat and they say, would you like a martini? And she's like, I don't deserve a martini. But then yes. maybe by the end of the flight, she's thinking, it's not bad. You it's know, not flying bad. First class. Yes. And I like what you brought up. You brought up this um, like undeserving or worthiness or that's not for people like me. Those are all like indicators of like, okay, wait a minute. You're walking around here with a bias. Is it serving or undermining like your fulfillment? Yeah. I, I bet there's I, just like there's common tropes in literature. There's I'm, I know for a fact that there are common tropes about money and um, and our relation to it. Um, oh, yeah. I uh, I wanted to share with you. I just I remembered that. I was at, at some professional gathering and there was somebody who was like a money psychologist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she had us all do an exercise where we pulled out our wallets and looked at our wallets and shared with each other about what was there. What did we see? Wow. And it was fascinating. I, um, I learned, here's a couple things I learned about myself. Yeah. My wallet is very, very, it's very organized. All the bills have to be facing the same way. All the credit cards are in a little slot. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, the wallet has to be a very bright color so that I will see it and not lose it in the bottom of my mm. purse. But one of the, um, there, there was much more to it than that. Okay. But um, here was just kind of like a practical thing. I realized in the 
the woman who I was talking with, who I was partnered with to explore our wallets together, um, we both had coin purses in our wallets, right? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that spoke sort of spoke to our age and our generation. Like I grew up in a time when you had to keep your coins in your pennies. You had to have those available, Mm -hmm. you know, to make change and stuff. And now with like what Apple wallet and Google wallet and all this stuff, it's like, it's like, what is a coin purse? I've never even heard of that. Right. And so I knew that I know that I have a lot of other stories or ideas or beliefs about money and finances that are probably outmoded. Yeah. And that's the work I think as an adult (laughs) is to try to figure out which ones are real, which ones are serving me Mm -hmm. um, and challenge, challenge those old, those old thoughts. What are, what, um, I'd love to know, I mean, can you think of a time where somebody's orientation to money turned around and it was a really happy discovery for them? Yes. I have a client that calls it a BMW moment. Mm -hmm. So we, (laughs) we're like, a BMW moment is when he realized like he could afford it and that it is okay just to want something because you want something. Right. Right. And, um, now he's looking at doing a home remodel and -hmm. he's like, this feels like a Gulf stream moment. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like a renovation in the Bay area. Yes. (laughs) It can sound, it can feel that way, but, but the work is, um, what did we do? We created, like what feels like a paycheck to him. So every month there's this stream of income. The income's coming from his portfolio. Okay. So it's not like, but it, for him, knowing that that income is coming in gives him that sense of like, oh, okay, I can spend money yep. on myself. Um, and before he met us, it was just kind of tucked away neatly and uh, he hadn't kind of like, part of it is inherited money too, right? So there's like a story there he's telling himself about, I'm not worthy. It's not mine. Someone else worked for this. I can't spend it. Right. All of those kind of messages and bit slowly, we kind of turn on the the flow of money and just demonstrate like, okay, like here's what, I'm making up a number. Here's what $3,000 a month additional income feels like, Mm -hmm. you know? And um, it's it's very interesting. You know, people who have a fortune feel like they don't have enough. Right. Sometimes. And it's, that's my job is to just show them what's possible with what they have. And yeah, it's, it's offering a new perspective. Well, when you think of money, I mean, one thing that just popped into my head was the idea that, you know, money is currency. And there's a lot of different ways that the term currency gets used. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, if you go to another country, if you want to be able to sort of speak the financial language, you may have to exchange some currency, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that, um, one's relation to money and how we think about it um, can be a way to get, to definitely get more in touch with who we are. What is our story? You know, who are, who are we? Like the, the man who doesn't deserve the money because he didn't earn it because it came mm-hmm. to him mm-hmm. um, as part of an inheritance. I mean, that's a tough one. That's hard to overcome. And not only is it a money story, but it's a story about who he is. Right. As a human being. Right. Um, and, and, you know, on the real estate spectrum, the, the home that he lives in tells a story. Right. Absolutely. Right. And um, yeah, it's, yep, yeah, purchased it with his partner and it's a symbol of their, it's like their relationship. 
this is something they've achieved together. <laughs> yes. Right? Two unmarried people, but this is the physical manifestation or the, yeah, this is how it shows up in real life. If you yes. want to have a symbol for the relationship. Yes. So, and so now they want to put money into making it home. Yes. And how, how there's, it's okay to do that. There's permission. And I want to go back to your point about money as currency, mm -hmm. because uh, it, it reminded me of cash flow. So currency, oh, I, I think of that. like a river, right? Cash so it's a flow. river, cash flow, mm -hmm. currency. There's a current running through the water. I always think of it as like the money comes into your life and you need it to do what you need it to do. And some, and then it goes, but if I have the belief that there's more coming my way, mm -hmm. something happens mystical <laughs> where it happens. Yeah. And I'm not like thinking like pie in the sky. I'm talking about like, okay, yeah. Like if I walk around with the belief that money comes to me mm -hmm. easily, right? it seems to, right? And I loved your thought experiment about like what your wallet symbolizes for you. Cause now you've got me thinking about like, Oh, well, my wallet was a gift from a friend and it was kind of like a hand me down and right. yeah. this what you know, <laughs> so, and I never have, yeah, it's, you got me thinking on that. Well, now here, here's how you got me thinking The you're talking about the flow of money. And uh, this is a personal story I'm going to relate where, um, as my, um, marriage was ending and I had, um, been in a situation where my partner managed all the money. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a very typical, uh, scenario, especially for, I think for women, um, mm -hmm. where they seed that even though I'm like a top producing real estate agent selling many millions of dollars of real estate every year. And I can balance my own checkbook, but did I give any thought to investments or savings or anything? Mm -hmm. No, I let my mm -hmm. partner do that part. So as we were splitting up, um, post 2008 Ooh, and, okay. and basically a lot of our assets and wealth had, was wiped out. Mm -hmm. Um, I was kind of starting over from, from the wow. beginning and and money had flowed in the past, but now I really had doubts about it. You know, how am I going to survive? And so um, what you made me think of is that I decided to build a little dam, a little dam that would collect some money, which was something I had not done before. You know, we had done mm -hmm. investing and 1031 tax deferred exchanges and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I started putting $500 a month into okay. a regular passbook savings account, $500 okay. a month, which seemed, I, I, I looked at that and just thought, oh, this is so sad. I'm never going to get anywhere. But hey, the end of the year, I had saved $6,000, which was a big deal, right? And there, mm -hmm. so there I had a little mm -hmm. reservoir and that, it gave me so much confidence. It gave me so much confidence that, hey, I built my my little dam. <laughs> Your reserve, yes. Now I can start letting some of that, like, let it flow out a little bit because there's more coming in. And confession, that account until very recently, I mean, it was years, many, many years, I kept that $500 a month thing going just automatically because psychologically it made me feel like I was taking care. I was yes. being careful. And that gave me the peace of mind I needed. Yes. And that, that story reminds me of uh, folks who um, out of an abundance of caution and out of not really knowing what their financial picture looks look looks like in real life, uh, they just practice a lot of, uh, they're really conservative with their right. spending. 
And so when I can show them, we're going to create an automatic savings program so that you get that peace of mind knowing, okay, I've got the future in mind with this program. And so when I take out a hundred dollar bill or a hundred dollars, whatever from the ATM, right? Like it feels okay at right. the same time. Right. So it's, yeah, that's a really great, great, uh, story. It's, it's safety. And oh, ultimate. Yeah. That's why people act so crazy around money because money is a proxy for survival. Right. Right. When you take away things that make people survive or what people believe will help them survive. They get really territorial, you know, it can bring out a lot of like basic human (laughs) reactions. We're not, we're we're not operating with our um, top level of, you know, thinking. So. Yeah. Like with with real estate, um, I I think of it as uh, well, so money is a proxy for survival. Shelter is is uh, foundational to surviving, and so yes. you you combine big money with the need for shelter, and you've got a tinderbox of of emotions uh, that are just waiting for the match to set it right. off. And that's that's why having someone tuned in like you are, and you know, like helping that client figure out how, how could you help them feel safer? Right. How could you help them feel safer? Um, one way that I try to help people feel safer when they're selling or buying real estate is to know that they actually have a lot of choices. Mm-hmm. Nobody's forcing them. They don't have to do anything. And I certainly don't have an agenda. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, so many people, you know, I will always say I'm much more likely to talk you out of writing an offer <laughs> than I'll never talk you into it. I will mm-hmm. definitely push you away from some things that I, you know, I, that I think maybe isn't a good choice. And that's such a relief for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's important that people have advisors in their life that truly have the best interest, their best interests at heart. Um, I think some folks in my industry give, give us a bad name when they take advantage of people's insecurities around money and maybe are selling products that don't actually fit their lives. Right. Uh, it fits the lives of the person selling the product because it gives them a commission or something like that. Exactly. Um, and I like that. It's like at the end of the day, you, I have nothing to gain other than maybe you'll have a portfolio that I manage for you. But even if you decide not to, I want you to make the right decision for you. And if you don't become a client, thank you very much. You know, I believe in like this karmic thing where I've helped this person on their way and it wasn't a right fit or not right now. And it just comes back. You just don't know when. <laughs> right. Well, you, you help them progress. And I think of myself as the real estate concierge, like whatever, however I can help people. And I often, you know, I'm often just volunteering to, tell a client's friend's brother about, you know, where to go get a new uh, kitchen appliance or something, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, Mm -hmm. that's something I offer for free. And um, there's not a sale anywhere in sight there, except maybe seven years down the road, my client's friend's brother calls me because he knows somebody who needs a realtor and or it comes up around in other karmic ways totally yes yeah i think absolutely in our line of work where we're people centric you just have to believe that the time and effort you're putting into this if it doesn't pay 
pay off with this specific client, it will. Yep. Either you've walked away from that situation and you've learned mm -hmm. a better way to express uh, or to, I don't know, showcase what you know. I don't know what it is, but it's like, yeah, everything happens for a reason, <laughs> I think. And, oh, this was a new one that was taught to me by my 80-year-old client. Trust the delay. Trust the delay. And she means by that, like, if, if uh, well, my interpretation is, like, if a client is hemming and hawing about something, give that space to happen. Yep. Nothing yep. you can do if you're trying to like prod a situation along it's not gonna turn out well for anyone right but if i just allow that space to allow that process to run through and i think with her 80 years of wisdom mm -hmm. you know i finally got it <laughs> i'm like oh yes you yeah give it, people the time they need to process it, yeah i mean so many times when we're talking about waiting for a crisis to play out and giving space for that, I can on dozens of times where something came up and like I was in a meeting or maybe I was gone overnight and there was a big brouhaha and a total crisis. And by the time I was done with the meeting or back from my overnight trip, it was all over. Everything was fine. <laughs> crisis yeah yes but i like and, you know, trusting and the delay trust the delay and i've been on the other side of that right where i think like oh gosh like this is an emergency and i just get wound up and ultimately you know 24 hours later it's fixed and perspective is important um in your profession and mine because we're not talking about uh, the decision to get organic tomatoes or regular tomatoes. We're talking about usually hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's not, a, it's not a 20 second debate. Mm -mm. Um, yeah. I, um, I often feel like, there's like a real estate emergency going on. In fact, the other day I had gotten a call. Something had to be done. I had to get back to my laptop to do this thing. And as I was driving, I almost felt like I had one of those little lights that you put on top of the car, you know, and the siren. <laughs> real estate emergency. <laughs> if I'd been pulled over by the police, I would have said, it's a real estate emergency. <laughs> Um, now I know just from reading about you and what I know about you, um, that another thing that we have in common is the, um, and this is an overused, you hear this a lot and some people just, they're, they just glaze over and roll their eyes, but we actively practice, uh, gratitude. Oh Yeah. Tell yes. me about your practice of, of gratitude and how it improves your work. You know, my higher power, whatever it is, had me practicing gratitude last night. I am in the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, and our rehearsal space is in a part of town that is at night known for break-ins. And so I was in rehearsal. I get to my car at 9.30 at night, and... There was a break-in in my car, and oh. what did I do? I said, oh, no. <laughs> and another chorus mate walked by and just kind of witnessed it, and he was like, is everything okay? And he's like, you know, one year it happened to me, like, multiple times. And I was, you know, and so I had my moment of gratitude right then and there. I was like, wow, I've gone this long, and it has not happened. And what did they ultimately take? They took a gym bag with some headphones and my dirty gym clothes. <laughs> um, they didn't take a laptop. They didn't take a phone, right? And so here I am today. 
I've already gotten the bag replaced. I've gotten the window replaced. And I'm thinking like, how fortunate are you that you can take something like this and fix it? Yes. Yes. And yeah, I have to come from a place of gratitude because it's going to weigh on me if I don't. And so the gratitude practice is like, okay, what really matters here? Like I'm safe. My partner's safe. Ultimately what they got away with is maybe a hundred or a hundred dollars worth of stuff. And thank God I have more than enough to take care of what needs to be taken care of to make me whole again. Right. And when the window repairman, you know, ran my credit card, they give you an option to tip because everyone gets tips now. <laughs> right. And Isn't that I, funny? Yeah. Right. You know, and I said, everybody except me, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> and I had gone up there to the garage with an idea of what I wanted to, to tip. But then in the moment, when I was just so grateful for the effort and time that this person had put into this, trying to make me feel better at the end of the day, like he approached it so empathetically, maybe more than you think a person replacing your window should. Mm -hmm. But when I came back, he had vacuumed all the glass up. It looked like nothing had ever happened. I was so grateful. And then I was like, this is where that cash flow gratitude practice comes in is like, okay, I might have over tipped, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, maybe that guy has a family. And maybe that money goes towards taking them out to a nice dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I won't miss it. My window's fixed. Right. And so mm -hmm. I don't know. So that's how I practice the gratitude. Yeah. I mean, I love that. That was like paying it forward, paying it for you. So First, you experience this thing. You're grateful that it wasn't worse and that everything's okay. Yeah. Then you're grateful that um, how lucky you are that you could make it better and l grateful to have what you have, that you could pay for the window replacement, Yeah. Um, that you could get your new clean gem clothes and a new bag, <laughs> that then you could um, also... Um, be grateful enough that now you could be grateful for the work that was done to make you whole and to, you know, and, and you probably tomorrow you'll extend it even further and be yeah. grateful that even though it was kind of a drag, maybe the person who took all of that stuff really needed it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's did. a bridge too far. <laughs> <laughs> what but, did my, uh, the, my, the principal of my firm said, well, you know what, this, this same time tomorrow, the person that stole your stuff will still be a jerk. <laughs> like, <okay. laughs> I'm like, all right, I'll take that. And then I just like release it because I don't want this thing to take up any more time and space. Right. And yeah. I just have to believe like there was a lesson here somewhere, which is don't leave anything in the car. <laughs> right. Yeah. In any, in any urban setting, in any city, yeah. anywhere in the world, if you leave stuff visible in the car, right. this, I'm sharing this with you, Manny. Yeah. <laughs> it's an invitation. It's almost a business opportunity. Right. 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 <laughs> you know, and maybe I was too cavalier with that, you know, but, but yeah, and I could have gone down this story of like, oh, San Francisco is awful and all these things. And that's not the direction I wanted to go. No. The direction I wanted to go was, let's get you whole and then go on about our day. It's right. not fun. It's annoying, but it happened and it's done. There, there's a parable. It's a Buddhist parable about um, two monks coming to a river. I'm trying to think how it goes. You probably heard it. They come to the river and there's a woman there who um, can't swim. And they're going to cross the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them says, I'll carry you. Now, they're not supposed to touch a female. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she gets on the one monk's back and they go across the river. 
They get to the other side. She goes on her way and they continue on their way. And the one who wasn't doing the carrying keeps saying, um, uh, you know, how could you do that? That was, you know, that was terrible. We, we really have no business touching a woman. You know, you're, you're, Mm -hmm. you know, I really don't know what I think about you, blah, blah, blah. And the one who was doing the carrying said, you know, it's funny. I just carried her across the river, but you're carrying her for miles here. Yes, exactly. It was, and, uh, um, I love that. I love that. I like that. I love that. Yes. And it's like, if we bring it back to a money story, are you still carrying a story that is not serving you? Right. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. I think a lot of us are. I know I am. Um, Well, you know how to find me. (laughs) (laughs) I absolutely do. In fact, I'll be calling you right after we're done with this. (laughs) So um, this has been fantastic and I hope we can do it again. Uh, Now, I always like to end with a little real estate story. Okay. So I'm wondering if you have one, anything to do with home or real estate or. Yes. What can you tell okay. me? Okay. So in 2021, um, I wanted to buy a house, but I felt I was priced out of San Francisco. So I started looking at Palm Springs. I was there uh, visiting a client, and then I stayed a few more days, and I was like, wow, it's kind of, it's really great here. <laughs> And yes. the price, <laughs> it's great. And the prices were like more reasonable, right? And for a two bedroom, two bath condo, I was like, wow, this is this is what a down payment would be <laughs> in San Francisco. I can get the whole thing down here. Um, and then the, you know, I had the interest rates were were really great. And I started shopping online and um, maybe I treated this like it was a regular online shopping experience. (laughs) There was a home that I saw and I'm like, oh, great. On paper, this looks great. And um, my friend was in town, best friend. And I'm like, hey, will you walk through the property with with the real estate agent? And so all of this is happening over the phone and uh, over the phone and email and virtually I had the agent walk through with like his phone and we're doing like a FaceTime through the property. And it's a good thing I wasn't there because, (laughs) (laughs) because the story goes, the lady that lived there, lived there and she smoked for like 16 years while she lived in this place. And so you, you know, imagine that's a, that's a hazmat situation. I, I you know, I and I wanted a project, and boy, did I get one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, uh, you know, I just took that leap of faith, and it was helpful that I was not there to do it. But you know, the magic of all of this is like you sign everything from San Francisco, and then in 30 days, you can go pick up keys in Palm Springs. It's just wild Mm -hmm. that that was my first home buying experience. Um, But it, yeah, it was really fun. And it's, I think that was like just allowing the process to happen, right? There was another house that I had put an offer on and it it fell through. Mm -hmm. It wasn't meant to happen. Right. This one, it, it was a great deal. And it just required time and effort for me to make it the way I want. And like to take a vision of what I wanted, which was a really great place to retreat in the desert. Mm -hmm. I've created it for myself. Well, now for my tenants that are there more than I am. So, (laughs) but. But But you you made your vision, you manifested a a vision and an idea that you had. I mean, what a beautiful thing to get to do. Yeah. And it no longer smells like anyone ever smoked there. Mm -hmm. It's very comfortable. Everyone, anyone who stays there says it's lovely and it's mine. And it's, you know, yeah. And it was the first time I felt like, wow, like 
you did that. Mm. You did that. And like, you can see it and you can show people. I love it. You know, that is a great feeling, especially when it can be a little bit of an extension of who you are and you can show, you know, you can show in this other way. Yes. I mean, we have art, you have your singing. Um, and, uh, but you know, this is a different kind of expression. Totally. Totally. Yes. You know, I like often thought like, okay, like what I want it to be like really muted colors. I wanted it to be very like, almost like a spa because <laughs> that's what I wanted. Relaxation, mm -hmm. relaxation in the desert. And yeah, I work on spreadsheets and I work on programs all day, working on financial plans for clients. But picking up a paintbrush has a different feel to it. And when that wall is done, it just is a different kind of satisfaction. So that's my real estate story. Well, Manny, thank you so much. And um, can you tell people where they can find you? Thank you. Yes. No, thank you again for having me. Um, they can go to hankywealth.com. That's H-A-N-K-E-W-E-A-L-T-H.com um, to find me there. Um, I'm also on YouTube. Um, and yes. we'll, I guess maybe we'll put a link to that um, in the description below. Mm -hmm. But it's I talk more about money and the weirdness people have around their money. Mm -hmm. I love money weirdness. It's just one more kind of weirdness, but one that we experience <laughs> almost every day, right? Um, yeah. Well, this has been a pleasure. We'll do it again. Likewise, and yes, I hope so. Thanks so much. Thank you.